it's away from everything else. It's a beautiful creek. It flows nice. It's just a pretty area. I don't know how you can describe it any better. I shot my first duck at the age of seven at the mouth of the Blackbird Creek. I've loved it ever since. Endless salt marshes, historic farmlands, and deep forests. The Blackbird Watershed is a unique, diverse natural habitat that has somehow gone virtually untouched and unnoticed by most Delawareans for hundreds of years. Located along the border of Kent and Newcastle counties, this ribbon of green surrounds its namesake, the Blackbird Creek, as it meanders from the Maryland border to Delaware Bay. Throughout its slow journey, from mature upland forests to vast tidal marshes, the Blackbird Creek is buffered by some of the most unspoiled natural habitat on the Delmarva Peninsula. It's one of the last pristine river systems that we have in Delaware. It has been protected so far and the environmental quality of it is so high you just can't find any other place like that in Delaware. That area down there, the Taylor's Bridge area south, contains one of the finest examples of coastal salt marsh anywhere on the East Coast relatively unspoiled, a good example of what it used to be like. Just great salt marsh habitat. The salt marsh habitat at the mouth of Blackbird Creek is just one of a number of distinct high quality natural environments found along its corridor. Part of the reason for this diversity is due to how the Blackbird was formed. During the last ice age, when sea level was 100 feet lower, Coastal rivers and streams, including the Blackbird, cut into the land to form broad, deep valleys. As the sea level rose, these valleys flooded and developed first into freshwater swamps and then salt marshes. This explains why the Blackbird Creek meanders and why it is surrounded by extensive buffering wetlands, and also perhaps why it was never altered. A lot of rivers in Delaware have been straightened where the uh, blackbird has not, so you get a lot more twisting and turning in it, so that adds to the distance. But the actual saltwater influence is a lot shorter than a lot of estuaries here in uh, central Delaware because of the way it's formed and because of the heavy uh, freshwater influence at its headwaters. Those headwaters can be found in Blackbird State Forest, one of the few large forested areas left on the Delmarva Peninsula. We've lost 80% of our forests in Delaware, so even if you look at this place on an aerial photograph um, with the, or even just on a map with the forests in green, uh, you can see, you can see this corridor. It shows up. There are only a couple places in Delaware and even on the Delmarva Peninsula that show up like that, so it really makes it unique. This large, mature forest not only ensures clean headwaters for the blackbird, it supports one of the most unusual wetland habitats on Earth, the Coastal Plain Pond, or Delmarva Bay. These forest ponds, filled only for part of the year, support frogs, salamanders, and other life forms found only on the Delmarva Peninsula, and only where there is habitat clean enough to support their unique survival needs. Through the years, the qualities of the Blackbird watershed have not only provided good habitat for plants and animals, but have also limited its development. Remote from the bigger cities and often wet for much of the year, the Blackbird attracted only a hardy few. It was traditionally either wilderness or uh, agricultural areas, or areas where people would go to get away from it all. You know, it was so raw that that's what drew folks to Blackbird. Farmers, loggers, trappers, and hunters. Many of those drawn to the blackbird quickly realized its value and wisely respected the resources and habitat they depended on. Part of the reason why it still is the way it is is because of generations of good stewardship 
uh, mostly from farming families and woodsmen who have lived in this corridor over time. The blackbird's natural riches encouraged early settlers to stay. Families like the Dukes of Taylor's Bridge thrived, with successive generations acquiring more land, assuring the preservation of both the resource and their way of life. We can trace it back to 1730, the original land, but in 1730, my ancestors bought more land, so they were here and settled, we figure, around 1600. They had been involved with the Hudson Bay Fur Company, so when they came down and saw the Delaware marshes with all the muskrat houses, that was really a drawing card. There have been very few new neighbors come in, it's been the same families who have grown up there into their third, fourth generation of family that's still living on their property. Over the years and through many generations, the Dukes have cultivated and cherished their special relationship with the blackbird. We've always made our living from the land, and the marsh was just a part of the life. Uh, in the winter, we would uh, trap, and in summer, we'd go boating. We'd go down to the river shore where the blackbird comes out and goes swimming. We'd ride our bicycles as kids, and it was just part of our life, and it's part of the farm. Such local stewardship meant that much of the blackbird remained pristine well into the 20th century and unchallenged by development. The land's not available because those of us who are here aren't interested in selling any of it. As you saw with the, the battle with Shell, we, we hung in there tooth and nail trying to preserve what the heritage represented there. Forty-five years later, the battle with Shell stands as one of the defining events in the Blackbird's history and the history of environmental protection in Delaware. Shell came in and started buying up land for the eventual purpose of building a refinery. And there were people down there who were for it, and there were people down there against it. And uh, one of the early people against it was a farmer named Jack Dukes who still lives there. We had the representative who came and sat right here at the table with us and drank coffee and ate sticky buns and told us how he grew up eating muskrat and doing all these same things, but he was going to make life better for us. <laughs> Others felt differently, and the Dukes, in their outspoken desire to protect the blackbird, became lightning rods for public opinion. Some of it got pretty rough down there. There was one thing where somebody put a diagonal spike in a field to catch Jack's combine when he went through uh, to damage his combine. Well, it could have killed him. Yet the Dukes and their supporters also attracted those interested in saving this little-known watershed, including Delawareans for Orderly Development, the Delaware Wildlife Federation, and Delaware Wild Lands. Our role was to carefully pick out and buy key areas to checkerboard and try to keep Shell from getting one great big piece. All that was was a slowing tactic. It, we knew that that wouldn't be enough in its own uh, to, to prevent it. Despite enormous odds, the Dukes and others generated enough support to attract the attention of Delaware's governor and save the Blackbird with the passage of the Coastal Zone Act. You can imagine how much power had to come from the people in order to make this happen. With all those powerful interests, our State Chamber of Commerce, nearly every law firm in Delaware being hired and assigned to work on this project, and the labor unions, with the exception of UAW, all fighting to uh, make it happen. And the people were able to convince people in government uh, that they had to pass this act in order to save the place. The passage of the Coastal Zone Act now protects the Blackbird's coastal habitat, but does not ensure the future of its inland corridor. Fortunately, as more Delawareans discovered the Blackbird, 
there are signs that the values that have historically protected it are alive and well. I think there's a reawakening and an expansion of that stewardship and environmental ethic that the longtime landowners have. Folks that have moved there for the same reasons people have been moving there for centuries to get away have, are take, stepping up and taking an interest in what is happening in this watershed. A lot of the farms, our neighbors and all, have put their land in farmland preservation, which we have done. So that will be in farmland open space for years and years. In addition to individual efforts, there is the continuing work of nonprofit groups committed to protecting the blackbird and its surrounding habitat. We've protected about 4,000 acres there, but there are pieces that can be brought together. There's still inholdings. There's still areas that have to be expanded. Meanwhile, the Nature Conservancy is working with a number of partners, including landowners, to develop the Blackbird Millington Corridor Conservation Area Plan. From our perspective, we want to uh, be able to sustain those plants and animals that, that call this corner home. Um, but from a broader community perspective, we also want to be able to sustain the kind of rural lifestyle that then supports this kind of use in the corridor and the kinds of conservation that have happened here. Finally, there are the efforts of the Delaware National Estuarine Research Reserve, a partnership of the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The reserve has long recognized the value of the blackbird and has monitored its ecology since 1993. Because the blackbird is so clean, it is a recognized control site for monitoring how watersheds react to increasing development pressure. We're analyzing what areas we need to protect to keep the environmental quality the way it is. We accept that development is coming. It's a natural expansion of uh, activities that are going on. And what we want to do is offer some options and solutions to help balance the needs of the system as well as balance the needs of the citizens of Delaware. The reserve is striking that balance in several ways, through the purchase of conservation easements and the acquisition of properties critical to the continued protection of the blackbird. A good example is the recent purchase of the former Odessa campground. In the next few years, virtually all of the existing infrastructure will be removed and the land will be reforested. Yet at the same time, there will be provisions made for public use. The blackbird component of the reserve has traditionally been managed as a research environment, so we try to limit or at least control the access to it so that we can make sure that our research is not impacted, our education efforts aren't impacted. This newest site allows us to develop a public access plan to meet the needs of the community while at the same time using the opportunity to educate them on what the reserve is doing and to show them that we are practicing what we preach. By buying and restoring desirable properties, purchasing conservation easements, and conducting research and public education, the reserve is building upon the traditions and values that have protected the blackbird since it was first settled. And for those who shared this vision early on, there is a growing feeling of satisfaction. Yeah, I am optimistic. Um, when I first started working for Wildlands, I, I wanted to see everything next year. And it took me until about 10 years ago before I realized this isn't a short-term thing. This is still going to be going on long after I'm gone, and probably long after my successor is gone. Since the Coastal Zone Act was passed, there's been a major, major successful effort uh, with the Delaware Wildlands, Nature Conservancy, the state of Delaware buying up the land, using federal funds in many cases, and thus protecting it in perpetuity. Now, a lot of the land has been put in farmland preservation, so we hope enough more will be put in that will preserve this area. It's one of the prettiest areas in the state. Well, just hope that the generations coming after us will be as proud of it as we are and, and do their very best to take care of it and not pollute it 
and hopefully keep it as as pure as possible for ever 